World Economic Forum. Welcome to this opening press conference uh, announcing <coughs> the details of the program for the 2014 annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, our 44th annual meeting. Joining me this morning, we have uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder and executive chairman of the forum, and my colleagues, Lee Howe, managing director, Robert Greenhill, Sadia Zahidi, and Jennifer Blanke. They'll all be telling us a little bit about uh, different aspects of the program at this year's meeting. But before uh, they go into some of the details, I would like to turn to Klaus to ask him for his view on the economic outlook as we look ahead into 2014. So without further ado, Klaus. Thank you, Adrian. It will be an exciting meeting. And it will be different from the last years because it will not be overshadowed by one single crisis. Let's face it, last year the Euro crisis uh, preoccupied everybody's mind. So the question is, what is the context of the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2014? I would characterize this context by three words. First, cautious optimism. Second, diminished expectations. And number three, many known unknowns. Let me explain. If you look at the cautious optimism, we just have to see Confidence is slowly coming back. Yesterday, the World Bank published a relatively positive report as far as the economic outlook is concerned. Stock markets are performing well. Confidence seems to come slowly back. But we have also diminished expectations because we all know we still have to deleverage Many countries still have large fiscal deficits. It's like running with a heavy backpack on your shoulders. So what it means is that I foresee for the coming period, it may be five to ten years, a relatively slow growth economy. Even if we move out of the crisis, we will not come back to the growth rates of uh, the pre-crisis situation. Now, if you take a growth rate of 3%, which will be probable, maybe a little bit more, and you compare it with the pre-crisis uh, growth rate of 5%, it seems to be marginal. But you know, if you look at the accumulated effect, 3% means that you double GDP only every 24 years. 5% means that you double GDP every 14 years. And of course, this means a huge uh, difference in terms of social inclusion, in terms of job creation, and so on. Now, let me come to the third characteristic, which are the many known unknowns. Just look at Europe. We still have unknowns. We still do not know what the stress test will give us of the banks. We still do not know how much the reforms uh, which we see in a modest way in the southern part of uh, Europe, how much they will close the competitiveness gap and so on. If you look at the US, um, we still do not know what the effect of the um, tapering will be. We have the U.S. elections. We still have many question marks. If you look at the emerging markets, I would say we see everywhere signs of a so-called midlife crisis in the economic growth of emerging uh, markets. It's easier to add 10% uh, economic growth if you have a GDP per capita of 1,000 or 2,000 compared to having a GDP uh, per capita of 10,000. And if you look at Japan, um, of course, uh, we do not know yet how successful the third arrow of the so-called Abenomics will be. So you have 
those rarely urgent questions to which we need a response, the known unknowns. We know the issues, but we do not know yet how they will, the problems uh, will unfold. And then in addition, if you take the known unknowns, you have all the fundamental issues. I, I would call them the global destiny challenges. Because if we do not master those issues, our whole destiny as mankind will be in some way put into question. It's the issue of social inclusion, it's the issue of global warming, it's to deal, all, uh, to deal with all the technological disruptions and uh, innovations, just takes the cyberspace, it's water, jobs, and so on and so on. So that's the context inside which we approach uh, the program of uh, the annual meeting. Now the question may be, what is different with the annual meeting? Why is it different from, I would say, any other meeting in the world? And I give you three reasons again. First, it's the foremost multi-stakeholder meeting. It's the biggest assembly of political, business, and civil society leaders. More than half of the um, CEOs of the 1,000 largest companies are in Davos. You have 300 political leaders, inclusive the heads of all major international organizations. And you have the heads of the most important, best known global NGOs. So you have those three pillars, which we call usually the three pillars uh, um, of um, a multi-stakeholder society. But it's not only business, civil society, and, and, and governments. Um, we want to have in Davos the disruptors. We want to have the new voices. We want to have also the moral voice. So you will see in the, in the documentation um, all those other communities, and I draw your attention particularly to the young voices, which are very important for us. And I may, I may remind you that in, in Davos in 2009, in my opening speech, I said we are moving, we, we confront now a financial crisis at that time, the financial crisis will cause an economic crisis, which we have seen. It will lead to a social crisis. Just look at the um, youth unemployment in many countries. And finally, and I think that's where we are now, it may lead to a intergenerational crisis. For me, that's the biggest challenge which we have and the biggest danger that we solve the big issues, what I called before the global destiny challenges, that we solve it on the back of the next generation. Finally, we have in, in, in Davos, of course, the best minds, Nobel Prize winners, and so on. You see it also in, in the material. But the second reason why Davos is different, the world is complex, it's fast moving, it's interconnected, and we in Davos want to provide a kind of mirror of the world as it is. It's not a meeting which is devoted to one single issue. It's a meeting which is purposely addressing the complexity of, of, of our world. And in this respect, of course, we will look at the hot issues on the global agenda, like the Middle East, but we also will um, try to address the fundamental um, underlying developments which I mentioned already, like social inclusion, job creation, and so on. What we want to do in Davos this year in this respect is to push the reset button. Let me explain. The world is much too much still caught in a crisis management mode. And we forget that we should take now into our hands 
and we should look for solutions for the really fundamental issues. We should look at our future in a much more constructive, in a much more strategic way. And that's what Davos is about. Yes, the actual hot issues, the actuality will play a major role, but most of the session will deal with the fundamental issues um, and not just with hot political uh, themes. Now, the third reason why uh, Davos is different, it's a take and give. Usually you go to a conference and you are a listener or you are a speaker. In Davos, everybody is integrated. Just imagine there are over 400 official and private sessions. Davos is well prepared. We had a preparatory session of over 1,000 specialists in Abu Dhabi in November. Um, we engage our members and partners uh, through Toplink, our new um, innovative uh, digital platform, uh, into the co-design of what we are doing. So it's a real uh, collaborative effort which we want to achieve in, in, in Davos. Now, why is the World Economic Forum successful? It's not because we are particularly good. It's because there is a need. And if I would have to define the role of the World Economic Forum in the world of today, where the borderlines between public and private are blurred. It is the international institution for public-private cooperation. Klaus, thanks very much for that. Um, the theme of this year's meeting, as you'll know, is the reshaping of the world, the consequences for society, politics, and business. And my colleague Lee Howell is responsible for turning that theme into some 260-plus sessions. And uh, I'd like to ask him to tell us a little bit more about that program and uh, some of the people who will be appearing in it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, first, I'd like to build from Professor uh, Schwab's opening remarks in the sense that I'd like to add some context on how we arrived at this program, as you rightly put it, with 250-so uh, uh, sessions. Um, I'll begin with that the 44th annual meeting development of that program began really at the close of the 43rd annual meeting last year, and we've been able to engage our communities through our regional summits, our various global initiatives, and our research activities. Uh, so it's been a very iterative process. I'd like to go back and highlight once again the importance of uh, a network of experts who've availed themselves and have committed to two years of working with us, and these are the members of our Global Agenda Councils. And indeed, we did um, have their second uh, meeting uh, in November in uh, Abu Dhabi, and it was, and it was very, very important in the sense that we are looking for the longer term issues. We're very much preoccupied by the various crises, but again, the notion of understanding really what is reshaping the world requires this multi-stakeholder collaborative and, and annual effort. So I want to start, start with that. that. Um, second, in terms of the program, um, again, I, I sort of, the best way for you to understand and explore it, um, ideally for you to, to go through all, all of the materials you have, is to, to understand that this, you have to unbundle this theme into, I think, four areas, and they were touched upon by Professor Schwab's remarks. Uh, one of the sub-themes is really is focused on achieving inclusive growth. Uh, and much of the program will look at a, a little deeper into the structural issues, and of course, particularly emphasis on the unemployment challenge, particularly in the youth unemployment space. Um, we then have a sub-pillar, a sub-theme around embracing disruptive innovation. And these innovations are not all uh, uh, linked to uh, uh, internet information technology, but we're also looking at uh, unconventional energy sources like shale gas. We're looking at 3D manufacturing or printing. We are looking at personalized medicine. So there's a whole host of innovations uh, across a, a number of dis disciplines that I think we need to take, take account of and have a really a, a more thorough look at because these will have consequences on uh, society, politics, and business. I, I would also um, guide you to the fact that there's a third pillar that was again touched on, and it was really about meeting society's new expectations, because one of the residual effects of, 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 of the uh, global financial crisis is still this lack of trust in both the public sector and the private sector and, and across societies overall, and how do we 
um, really reassess and rebuild that because that, that takes time. Uh, that takes time and that's why it takes vision and it takes really not just a consensus but a common vision to really get us there and I hope we're able to achieve that through uh, the interaction and engagement of our uh, communities in Davos. And fourthly, um, we're all aware that we're on a smaller planet in the sense that we, how do we sustain a nine billion people? And this is where we are looking in, in together holistically issues around climate change but also around poverty. And I, and I bring your attention to a very important session that really looks at the two as we know that uh, uh, this year and next year are very critical years for the UN and other institutions, international institutions and their efforts to address climate change but also to think of uh, beyond the current Millennium Development Goals. So this holistic approach is also very, very important in the program. And, and so I, I would sort of direct you in those, uh, those areas. And also that it's the way we, we learn and interact. And we, we are very interactive. We have a number of workshops, ideas labs, um, formats that really, I think, uh, encourage um, the peer-to-peer -peer and informal uh, experience in the sense that we can get people really to be candid and be aware and be mindful of the issues and work together. And that's really the, the design and the, and the aspirations of the program. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the key sessions that we should really look out for in the program? I, I know, having asked you this before, that you, you're reluctant to single out any one particular session from all of them, but just to help guide uh, some attention, anything especially notable? Well, I would again pick up on, on Professor Rob's remarks. I think there's something very notable. If you draw your attention, historically we've had one of the sort of the capstone, the highlights of the annual meeting is our global economic outlook session taking place on Saturday. Um, this is historic in the sense that this year we have uh, really um, three of the most important uh, central bank governors. Uh, Governor Mark Carney of the Bank of, bank of England, uh, the president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, and of course, uh, Hariko Kuroda of the Bank of Japan. And I think it's a very significant moment in time to have these uh, uh, leaders along with the head of the IMF and important, other important finance ministers and this global economic outlook um, because of, I will go back to the cautious optimism and, and the fact that there are clearly uh, known unknowns here that we can, we can really, uh, I think, address more concretely as we look at the year ahead. Lee, thank you very much. Um, Robert Greenhill, our Chief Business Officer, is going to take some time just to tell us a little more detail about who will be in Davos this year, and also to share with us a couple of major initiatives that will be launched at the annual meeting. Robert. Thank you, Adrian. Well, this year we expect some 1,500 business leaders from across all sectors and around the world. Uh, we have, like in previous years, uh, a growing number of participants from the key emerging and developing countries, so we'll have over 250 uh, business leaders from the BRIC countries alone. Uh, and in addition to the, the key Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 CEOs, as Professor Schwab mentioned, we'll also have some of the key disruptors, the innovators, the new champions, who are either tech pioneers, technology pioneers, social entrepreneurs, global shapers, or the young global leaders, including, for example, Tony Fadell of Nest Labs, a leader in the Internet of Things, a Brian Chesky of Airbnb that's transforming a commercial rental space and helping people actually meet their expectations in a world of, of, of lower economic growth. And then social entrepreneurs such as Jordan Casalo of VisionSpring, who's a leader globally in low-cost eye care uh, for emerging markets. And in addition to having uh, more CEOs and chairmen attending than ever before, they're more engaged than ever before. Uh, we'll talk about a number of the different specific events, but I think there is no doubt that out of this moment of crisis, there is no return to complacency, either in terms of having to rethink their always transforming business models, but also to continue to engage on some of these key unresolved social and global issues. So uh, the International Business Council will be doing a major session on youth unemployment. Uh, there's going to be a lot of conversations around the climate change and, and a circular economy that my colleague Sadia will be talking about in a, in a moment. And more broadly, the whole issue of restoring trust. And how does one rebuild the relationship uh, between business, uh, governments, and the broader society? In addition, there's two specific initiatives I'd like to focus on. One is around the area of health. As Professor Schwab was mentioning, there was a real focus on the key crisis issues of the last couple of years. While the one uses the health analogy, we may be out of the intensive care room, but certainly we're still in the rehabilitation area for the global economy. And it's clear one cannot have uh, healthy global economy or national economy without a healthy society composed of healthy and happy in individuals. And so health actually has a very important economic 
uh, role to play. And the context of health has changed. From the infectious diseases challenges of 10 years ago, where the forum played a key role in the launch of Gavi and the Global Fund and other key initiatives, the challenges today are around non-infectious diseases. It's around the challenges of aging. It's dealing with emerging economies that, while still wrestling with infectious diseases, need to deal with the onslaught of uh, diabetes or other non-communicable diseases. So new challenges, but also massive new opportunities in terms of the return on investment of prevention, in terms of using new technologies, whether it's wearable technologies or the individualization of healthcare. Huge opportunities, but also requiring a very different focal point. It's not simply an issue for the healthcare industry anymore. ICT has a role to play. Food and beverage uh, companies have a role to play. Telecoms companies have a major role to play. Similarly, it's not just for the healthcare ministries. It's for the finance ministers. It's for the, the people involved with a national planning. It's for the heads of government. So what we'll be doing at Davos this year is a triple play around health. First, around making the new innovations in health very real and personal for attendants. They'll have indicators in terms, of, in terms of their actions, what they eat, how they move around Davos, including by walking, to make the healthy choices the easy choices. We'll be providing wearable technology to help them understand better their, their health situation in terms of walking, sleeping, et cetera. And we'll have an unparalleled set of programs to help them understand what health means for them, their family, their community, their corporation. Secondly, we'll have 25 public and private sessions, the most ever on health, looking at some of these key issues of prevention, also looking very importantly at the issue of not just physical health, but mental health, in terms of the destigmatization of the challenge of mental health. Uh, which actually in many economies is uh, one of the leading drivers of um, absenteeism and actually uh, costs, and which will be compounded with a challenge to dementia and the mental uh, challenges associated with aging in the future. Then we'll be culminating with a health summit on Friday afternoon, which is bringing together this whole group of, of actors, not just the healthcare actors of today, but the health system uh, actors of tomorrow across the different sectors, across the different levels of government. That's one major element. The second one I'd just like to take a moment on is there will be a, van, a Partnership Against Corruption Initiative Vanguard. The forum has been involved for over a decade in the issue of confronting the challenge of corruption and um, providing a context of, of improved integrity. This year, there's a group of CEOs who really want to come together to commit to creating a community to help raise the profile of integrity and anti-corruption and actually be involved in working with civil society and governments to help design out corruption. There's a sense that it's at a tipping point legally and in terms of social attitudes, and now is the time to move corruption into the same category of social ills as slavery and dueling was in past centuries, where it's seen as endemic and inevitable, but in fact, with the right changes in legal and social attitudes, it was possible to design those out. So they are the exception rather than the rule. This group of CEOs working with other stakeholders wants to actually push towards the same thing in corruption. So those are a couple of the key initiatives that we'll be uh, spearheading this year at Davos. Robert, thanks very much. Klaus mentioned uh, the three pillars that we draw on to put together um, participation in the annual meeting. One of them, civil society. My colleague Sadia Zahidi heads our gender parity and human capital programs here at the forum. And Sadi is going to bring us up to date with representation of civil society at the annual meeting and also talk a little bit about the two areas that she leads and some of the climate work that we can expect to see unveiled at the annual meeting uh, in a week's time. Sadi. Thank you. Um, civil society clearly plays a very critical role in addressing some of the long-term challenges that my colleagues have outlined um, that we're going to be looking at at Davos. Um, we'll have nearly 150 civil society leaders um, present at Davos, including um, 40 of the leading regional and global NGOs in the world. So um, uh, organizations such as uh, Save the Children International, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, um, Greenpeace, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature, Transparency International. Um, in addition, 10 labor leaders um, from global and national uh, umbrella bodies, including um, Philip Jennings of the Uni Global Union, Sharon Burrow from the ITUC, um, the Swedish Trade Union Confederation, um, and the European Trade Con Union Confederation. 
um, almost 20 religious leaders, um, including Ayatollah Iravani from Iran, um, the head of the Japanese Buddhist Federation, the head of the World Council of Churches, um, the newly appointed chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, um, and three cardinals, including Cardinal Turkson from Vatican City. Um, in addition to these, there are about 80 um, civil society organizations that come from the new champion communities. Um, so for example, through the Young Global Leaders, through the Global Shapers, which are leaders between the ages of 20 and 30, and through our social entrepreneurs communities. Um, now on gender, clearly the integration of women is um, critical to global growth, um, but it's not just a matter of efficiency, it's also a matter of <coughs> equity. Um, women should have equal access to health, education, economic participation, political empowerment. Um, and this is an area where the forum has been doing significant work for some time. Um, over the last year, we launched our eighth annual um, edition of the Global Gender Gap Report. Um, some of the very key findings are um, at the very top of um, the global rankings that cover 136 countries. Um, are, is Iceland, uh, followed by a number of other Scandinavian countries, and towards the very bottom countries such as um, Pakistan, Chad, and Yemen. Um, we've been doing this benchmarking for some years. We've also been collecting a lot of data and research on what are the best practices, what are the interventions that can help close gender gaps. And one of our major efforts over the last year, and that will be featured at Davos, is the attempt to operationalize that. How do you make that translate into success? How can those best practices, how can the information on gender gaps be actually used to try to close gender gaps? We've been doing that in three countries, um, in Japan, Mexico, and Turkey, working with their governments and working with the key business leaders in those countries um, to try to create a, co a collaboration mechanism, to try to create commitments around closing the economic gender gap by 10% in each of these countries. Uh, all of the practices are localized to the particular context um, that they're working on. Um, some highlights on gender uh, for the annual meeting. Uh, nearly 400 women leaders are present. That makes up 16% um, of the participation um, at Davos. 21% um, of the speaking roles are, um, are taken up by women leaders. Um, and of course, some of those names um, are, are, I'm sure you're very familiar with, names such as Sheryl Sandberg, Marissa Meyer, Judith Roden, Indra Nui, uh, they're all going to be present um, at the annual meeting. There are about eight sessions um, across the public and private program that are actually trying to look at gender parity as an issue. Um, and we're trying to cover topics as diverse as what are the business goals on gender parity? How do businesses really put practices in place that empower women, not just at entry level positions, not just in middle management, but all the way through to the very top of organizations? Second, looking at public policy around gender parity. What are the types of measures governments can put in place to create the right kinds of systems within which the division of labor at home and the division of labor at work takes place? Um, religion and women, um, women empowering the next generation of women leaders. How do they pull up that next generation behind them? So a number of issues that are being covered across the program that look at gender parity. Um, human capital, um, which is another area where the forum um, last year um, created a, a significant intellectual effort um, to try to look at this issue. Um, clearly, the um, a nation's human capital endowment is uh, one of the most important factors in determining the growth and the medium to long-term competitiveness of a country. Um, yet some countries are facing aging populations, some countries are facing youth bulges, and there are actually countries that are facing both. So how within that context do you try to ensure that that human capital is healthy, is educated, is actually being channeled into the workforce? Um, and to try to bring some objective, quantitative analysis to that, we launched last year the Human Capital Report. It covers 122 countries, and we're going to be using the findings of that report throughout the annual meeting program, as well as um, having a major workshop to try to determine how do we focus our own efforts around education, around health, around uh, employment, and skills in particular over the next year. Um, and then finally on climate change, um, this is obviously an area which represents a major public good challenge. Um, it's an area where no one entity, not governments, NGOs, businesses can be working on alone. 
Um, and that's why Davos offers a unique platform to be able to bring these different entities together. Um, in particular, this year um, is very relevant because we have a collaboration with the United Nations Secretary General and with the UNFCC um, to try to build up towards the UN Climate Change Summit um, in September and use Davos to try to spark off um, a very large number of public-private collaborations. Um, and that's going to be happening through approximately 35 climate change and sustainability sessions uh, taking place in particular on Friday the 24th in Davos. And we're going to be looking at themes as diverse as um, scaling energy efficiency, reducing deforestation, looking at resilient cities, um, and scaling investment for green energy. Sadia, thank you very much. My colleague Jennifer Blanke, our chief economist, leads uh, two of the biggest uh, research areas at the forum, risk and competitiveness. Jennifer, can you talk us through how some of that research will underpin the discussions in Davos next week? Great. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and I'd just like to say that in addition to the important uh, work that uh, has been mentioned by Robert uh, and by Sadia, uh, there is going to be quite a bit uh, feeding into the program uh, in terms of these two areas, uh, competitiveness uh, and global uh, risks. Uh, and I'd like to just go into a few details uh, in each of these areas to give you a flavor of what that's going to look like. Now, first on the competitiveness side, uh, clearly the Global Competitiveness Report and some related studies are going to be providing Im important input. Uh, and in fact, we've continued to have our regional focus uh, over the year with a number of workshops in various countries and regions, in Africa, uh, in, in a number of places in Latin America, for example, in Asia. Uh, and in particular, there have been two big work streams uh, that we've been working on that I'd like to highlight, uh, just to give you a flavor of how we try to really kind of get even more deeply uh, into these topics. First, uh, in, in Europe, uh, we have been working on trying to understand how to bridge that uh, competitiveness gap that Professor Schwab uh, mentioned earlier. And in fact, Professor Schwab released uh, a book a little over a year ago looking really at this concept of the reemergence of Europe and what needs to be done for that to happen. Uh, so in this light, the uh, competitiveness and the Europe teams have been working on a work stream really looking at how to really make this happen. And over the past year, over the course of 2013, we've been looking in particular at the whole concept of the ecosystem of innovation-led entrepreneurship and how you can create this ecosystem really in order to encourage growth and jobs, which is something really so important for the region right now. There will be a report on the topic coming out uh, at Davos next week, and then very high-level discussions between business, government, as well as members of the European Commission in order to see how this can be driven forward. Obviously, we will continue working on the topic over the coming year and with a number of other reports uh, related to Europe's competitiveness coming out throughout the spring. Now, the second uh, area I wanted to mention is really in line with our desire to effect real change in terms of competitiveness and living standards at the national and the regional level. Uh, and in order to do this, what we've been doing is um, working around the concept of the competitiveness lab. Uh, and the idea here is that you would, you know, workshops are very important, but here you would actually create a task force of business, government, civil society leaders who will work together over a course of one or two years with the goal of actually coming up with actionable agendas for driving competitiveness, for improving uh, living standards uh, at the national level. And as I mentioned, this will be piloted in Latin America uh, next year. We have already been constituting uh, the task force. And they will be looking at two interrelated issues that have been mentioned already by Sadia, which really are skills and innovation and the gap in Latin America and how those can be filled in order to really give a boost com to competitiveness in the region. And we will have some meetings in Davos among the task force members who will then uh, move the agenda forward over the coming year. Now, as well as the regional uh, efforts that we've been undertaking over the past uh, several years, and particularly over the last year, we've also been working on the concept of city competitiveness. Uh, cities are very important, clearly, as more than 50% of humanity lives in them today. Also, they can be very interesting sort of petri dishes in terms of looking at them for the sorts of levers that you can pull in, toward, in, in order to improve living standards, improve productivity, improve competitiveness. Our Global Agenda Council on Competitiveness is specifically working with us on this topic right now. And what they're trying to do 
is to come up with a taxonomy, not a ranking, we have lots of rankings, but a taxonomy of competitiveness at the city level. What are the things that you need to have in cities in terms of soft and hard infrastructure, uh, in terms of the institutional environment to make them truly competitive? Uh, this will be uh, the topic of a, a session as well uh, in Davos where we will be talking a bit about the topic and then we will be releasing a report later in the spring really looking more at the detail, also calling out a number of cities that are you know, exhibiting best practices. Um, now, obviously, you know, one of the factors that keeps coming up and, and that is very much related to this whole concept of competitiveness is the importance of thinking beyond the short term. Uh, it's very important to think long term when you think about the sorts of policies and investments that are needed in order to really place societies and economies on a sustainable track going forward. And the importance of taking a long term view is also very clearly reflected in the work that we do on global risks. Uh, and the Global Risks 2014 report, as you may or may not know, will be released tomorrow morning. Now, while I can't say a whole lot about the report today, given that it will be released tomorrow morning, and I hope that you will watch for that, um, I can tell you that we will be looking again really at the longer term. We're taking a 10-year uh, horizon in terms of understanding in the minds of the world's leaders what are the risks that we really need to be concerned about that can come together in unexpected ways uh, for terrible consequences if they're not dealt with uh, over time. And two of the main messages again are the importance of taking that long-term view about thinking uh, beyond the next quarter, thinking beyond the next election uh, in order to really set society on the type of path that it needs to be going forward. And second, not surprisingly, that we need government, business, civil society to work together on these issues and across borders because these risks know no borders. Uh, and without collective action, we really cannot solve them. Uh, clearly, uh, the report will provide the basis for a number of sessions uh, at the annual meeting, pro uh, in the annual meeting, uh, and I just ask you to watch this space tomorrow. It will be released at 9 a.m. Uh, GMT. Uh, and I think just to conclude, uh, I, I think you know, this gives you a flavor of some of the things that we're doing in our space uh, that we'll be trying to push for action uh, really at the annual meeting. Uh, and a flavor of some of these longer-term insight issues that the World Economic Forum is working on. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks to all my colleagues. And um, we can only bring uh, some 2,500 people into Davos itself, but we try and in involve uh, everyone in the discussions that go on there. We've got some 20-plus televised sessions, some 40-plus sessions that will be live-tweeted in different languages, and on a variety of different social media platforms, we'll be using... Uh, those platforms to engage uh, and get opinions from people uh, outside Davos to actually make the conversations in Davos richer and more reflective of the diverse views that we see uh, on all these different matters that we've heard from from my colleagues. Um, we've got time for some questions. If you can uh, just raise your hand, if I can get a sense just looking around the room of who has a question, um, it'll let me sort of judge how we need to ration the remaining time. Uh, if you can tell me both your name and the, uh, the news organization you represent. And I'm joined in the room by a number of my colleagues uh, from Europe, Africa, from some of our other research work and the Middle East, who will happily pitch in on any deep dive questions you might have. Um, but first off, if I can just see some hands again. And we've got some microphones that are going to come round. So can we start with the gentleman there and the lady on the end? So. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Schwab, this is Jamil Shade from Isar de São Paulo. My question is about the participation of Mrs. Dilma Rousseff. She has confirmed it's an election year in Brazil. You've mentioned very clearly that it is a midlife crisis for emerging countries. What are the challenges or what do you expect to hear from her? And secondly, you also said about uh, new voices. Uh, did you invite the other candidates in the elections in Brazil? And are they coming? And would you like to hear what their perspectives are for the country? Thank you. Thank you. And the lady on the end. Thank you. Uh, my questions are for Professor Schwab. Uh, the first one is about uh, 
Mm, would you please share with us your personal understanding of this year's dam reshaping the relationship or the difference from the world reform? And the second one is about China. You have mentioned the U.S. and Japan. So how about China? China recently announced a, a set of reform plans. Would you please comment on that, your expectations or the po possible implication of these plans for the country itself or to the world? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you for those questions. I, I just can ensure you that we will have a senior leader from um, uh, China in Davos, even if he may not be mentioned yet in the list. Um, and we, as you have seen, we have a very comprehensive delegation for, of business leaders and particularly also intellectual leaders uh, from China, just underlying uh, our long-standing partnership uh, we invited the first delegation, uh, Chinese delegation, to Davos in '79. So it will be 35 years of uh, strong Chinese participation in, in, in Davos. Now, we will, all the issues you mentioned certainly in one or the other way will be addressed. Now, if I come uh, to Brazil, um, I... Um, I'm very pleased and, uh, to, to have, after President Lula, who has also come to Davos, um, having um, President Rousseff in, 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 in Davos. And I'm sure uh, she will um, be engaged in a number of discussions, um, talking about the reforms, talking about how to overcome this midlife crisis, because at the end, I think she has a track record, particularly in terms of social inclusion, as we all know. And I'm sure that um, uh, Brazil has all the ingredients uh, to come out very well of, so, of those midlife crises. So it will be very interesting uh, to listen to her. But her presence in Davos, I think, is a great sign of the confidence uh, she has and the international business community has in the future of Brazil. Thank you. Can I just get a sense from that side of the room? Can we get a uh, microphone to these two gentlemen? Tom Miles from Reuters. Thanks very much. Um, I wondered if you invited Hodakovsky, and uh, if not, why not? And if, if whether he's coming, uh, if you did invite him, and if, if he's not coming, uh, did he give a reason? And also, can you tell us anything about what you expect uh, from President Rouhani of Iran? How long is he likely to stay? What's he going to do? Who's he going to meet? Thanks very much. OK, thanks for that. Um, I think Mr. Khodorkovsky's uh, release came a little too late to get an invitation to him, but I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Merek Dusek, to uh, just speak a little bit about President Rouhani. Sure. Uh, this is uh, the first time since uh, 2004 that we have a sitting uh, president of Iran in Davos with us. Um, of course, uh, this is coming at a crucial time um, in his mandate after uh, the president uh, uh, really created a very constructive momentum around uh, uh, the place of Iran in the world. So that's going to be also the theme of his official engagement uh, with us in Davos, Iran, the place of Iran uh, in the world. And of course, uh, also uh, his view on uh, the relationship with the rest of the world. Thank you. Gentlemen. I can uh, okay. respond Sorry, to, the, uh, to your question, Khodorkovsky. Um, we, we have a tendency in Davos not necessarily uh, to, to follow what is in the news at the moment. And as far as uh, Mr. Khodorkovsky is concerned, we certainly could consider an invitation next year. It first has to be clear. Um, what his future is, and um, uh, that's not yet uh, very obvious. Thank you. Gentlemen, just... Uh, Jürgen Dunsch, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. I have a question about the World Economic Forum as an organization. Professor Schwab, can you confirm that the Foundation Board will decide uh, during the Davos meeting whether the mandate of uh, Joseph Ackermann will be prolonged or not? And if he gets a new mandate, uh, does it mean that the statutes of uh, the World Economic Forum have to be changed? The World Economic Forum is a, as you know, is a not-for-profit 
organization. Um, we, we are aware, and it will remain a, a not-for-profit foundation, as uh, many other organizations are. Um, what we are doing at the moment is um, uh, uh, going into the direction of an international institution for public-private uh, cooperation, and this will mean uh, some uh, changes also in our um, uh, institutional documents. Uh, for example, you have the first sign in the much stronger presence of international organizations inside our foundation board with uh, leaders uh, of the IMF, of OECD, of some of the development banks, uh, of the um, um, Global um, Financial Sustainability Board, and so on. Exactly, and uh, the Foundation Board takes its own decisions, and it's for the board to decide as our supervisory body. Um, we, we don't prejudge those decisions. Um, lady on the front, and if I can take the lady on the back there. Um, my name is Isabel Sacco. I work for the Spanish news agency EFE. Um, Mr. Trapp, I, would, uh, I see a very strong presence, uh, political presence from Latin America. Um, what is the sense uh, you give to this choice? Okay, and can I just take the question from there? Uh, glad you can Sonntag Zeit und Tagesanzeiger. Uh, Mr. Schwab, would uh, Angela Merkel have come had she not fallen off her skis? And my second question is, uh, Syria, is this any topic at all? And the third question concerns hospitality. Do you feel like a milk cow sometimes in Davos? Do you think it's a real issue, the hospitality up there? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I had The first to, question, I, Angela Merkel. It was hard to understand yeah. your question as... as, as uh, uh, let's uh, start with Mrs. Merkel. You know Mrs. Merkel was a regular participant uh, since many, many years in Davos. We regret her ski accidents at all, what I can say. Um, the, I wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, for, for Latin America, um, the Forum has been involved in Latin America since the 70s, I would say. I, uh, uh, Latin America is a very important um, uh, region. You have new developments in, in Latin America. You have a number of elections. Uh, we have all the reform processes going on in, in Mexico. So it's very appropriate to have Latin America in such a strong way represented in Davos. And there was just a reference to the hospitality of, uh, of Davos and uh, some of your remarks uh, from last Sunday. Maybe um, our uh, managing director in charge of uh, uh, the Swiss relations, operations Alois and Zwingi. resources, Alois Zwingi, uh, may answer this question. Thank you. Uh, it is clear that without the support of Davos, the local politi politicians and, and the people of Davos, we couldn't pull off this event. And in all these years, we really enjoyed a great support of, of the community. And we work very closely with the local hotel and, and, and restaurant association to make sure that our participants actually have a good experience. Unfortunately, there are always some people who try to take advantage of this unique business opportunity. And we are working with the community to make sure that actually all participants have, have a good experience. But it is in fact true that one or the other uh, service provider is still in need of improving uh, their service level. Um, Adrian, if I just yeah. may say, why we put such an importance to this issue is the following reason. Davos is a carte visit of Switzerland. So there's no place where so many important opinion makers are assembled as it is in Davos. So it's not only in the interest of Davos, it's in the interest of Switzerland that we show the best of Switzerland the best of Davos, the best of the spirit, what is called the spirit of Davos, which reflects the spirit of Switzerland. Thank you. Lady at the back and on the other side as well. Two hands. 
I think we're just, we're just getting a microphone to you. Okay, thank you. There you go. Uh, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. I notice in looking through your um, program that you have quite a few sessions on the refugee situation in Syria. Uh, I would like to know whether you are also dealing with the explosion of refugees in Africa. Nothing here has really been said about Africa, and I was wondering what sort of an approach or what kind of prominence you are going to be giving to the both economic and social issues which are uh, uh, reigning there. Thank Great. you. Great. Good point. Can I just turn to, and um, we'll just get a microphone uh, whizzing up to our Director of Africa, Elsie Kanza. Elsie, can you address that for us? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, and you're absolutely right that uh, Africa, and in particular Sub-Saharan Africa, is seeing uh, an upturn in humanitarian crisis. Um, just for your information, we will have the current head of the African Union. This is the Prime Minister of Ethiopia present. And we also expect to have the Foreign Affairs Minister of South Sudan. And we plan to have uh, a number of uh, more private discussions uh, with other key uh, opinion makers, including foreign affairs ministers of some of the key European countries that have been involved, as well as heads of international organizations, just to see how we can create and build on the uh, current sense of momentum and urgency about how the world can mobilize um, and the region can mobilize to address the tragedies that are unfolding. Elsie, okay, thank you very much. May I add sure. one, one point here? I think it's very important when you deal with this issue like refugees that you have not just a dialogue. Um, of course, we address the issue. It's such a serious issue, and you have to, to create a situation where people can really imagine what it means to be a refugee. And for this reason, we have two uh, special, let's say, events in Davos. We have a, a refugee camp where we simulate for participants a refugee camp. So you may go to, to, uh, to, if you are in Davos, to experience what it really means to be a, a, a refugee. Um, and the second thing we are doing, um, we, we are creating um, a, a, a special space in, in Davos where we again simulate the experience of a Syrian of a Jordanian um, refugee in a Syrian, uh, in a Jordanian, I'm sorry, in a, Jordan, a Syrian refugee in a Jordanian uh, refugee camp. So you are put into the situation of a, of a refugee. I, I, I stress it because um, it's one of the issues uh, which are uh, so serious and we feel it's our role to make sure that people really know what it means and do not just have a dialogue and discussion about it. Thank you. Um, lady at the back. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexican News Agency. Uh, Mr. Schwab, uh, I would appreciate if you can elaborate on the role of Mexico in Latin America and the presence of the President uh, Enrique Peña Nieto. Thank you. The participation of the presidents of Mexico is a tradition in, in Davos, but I think this year uh, President Peña has a special message because he's now over one year in, in the office. He, in a very courageous way, has undertaken a number of reforms recently in the energy field. I know it's very contested, but I think it's uh, very crucial for the future of the country so we are eager to hear more about it. Thank you. I know there's a few more questions still in the room. Uh, we're going to have to call the, this phase of uh, the press conference to a close, but there'll be time just afterwards to follow up any questions with my colleagues here on the panel. Uh, thank you for your participation. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And I look forward to your engagement online and uh, in Davos itself. Thank you. <laughs>